Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Intelligent Moron with Alex Silva. I am your host, Alex Silva. I hope everybody's having a good day. This is episode numero six on this Thursday, March 11th, 2021. I hope everybody's doing okay, doing good. There's this thing that I've been wondering lately. And by lately, I mean this morning. Um, I am a big not just big, maybe a giant fan of history. I enjoyed history a lot as a kid. I thought that it was one of the most, one of the more entertaining subjects, something that you could like, um, kind of kick back in. It never really was a hist- a class that you had to really, oh, like, uh, apply too much brain power into like math or science. No, don't get me wrong. I enjoy science too. Math was a little bit of a doozy for me, but in general, I enjoyed history quite a bit. Social studies in some areas of the country or planet. Um, but I enjoyed it quite a bit. I enjoyed learning about the past, knowing where we came from, knowing what happened in order and what which ordered um, the formation of a country, a state, a movement, a uh, what progressed uh, people, whether it be a bill or a law or a uh, war, whatever. I enjoyed history quite a bit as a kid. I I think I first really liked it in seventh grade because I had this teacher, and where I grew up, everybody knows this teacher. Um, everybody knew him for what uh, one reason or another, um, and I, I won't say his name, uh, but he's no longer with us. Uh, rest in peace, sir. But he uh, he he had this very very. Um, laid back way of teaching. And I remember like being shocked at this because when in, when I was in sixth grade, right, right, right before I entered seventh grade, which is going to be changing schools, going to another school. Um, I don't know if you guys have like a big, like giant school where you're from, where you get like K through 12 or whatever. But with, with how I grew up with was we had a kindergarten and a first grade. Then we had a second, third, fourth grade school, fifth and sixth grade school, seventh and eighth grade school, and then freshman to uh, senior high school. So um, four different schools. So um, wait, was it four? Can I... Yeah, no, five actually. Wait, hang on. I got to do the math. I'm sorry. Let me see. Five, 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 five. My bad. Five, five different schools. Um. And, you know, um, the rumor was that this teacher was mean, weird, strict, uh, and everybody was talking about map exams, map exams, map exams, map map exams. Those were always the thing, like, you got to make sure you know your map exam. You got to make sure you know where the countries are on the world because he only gives, like, barely any homework and all it is is map exams and people who don't do, do well on the first one um, will be like, uh, screw the rest of the year. Now I'm thinking like, well, that seems odd because coming from like sixth and fifth grade, you have so many different opportunities to do well in school through homework and through, uh, tests and a lot of uh, projects and all that. And I'm like, I'm thinking like, okay, maybe this guy doesn't do that at all. And I'm literally having like nightmares before going to school there because I'm like wondering like, is this guy's class going to fuck me over so badly? Or is he just going to be like, or, or the, are the rumors real or are they true? I wasn't really sure. And so I got there and I remember like wondering like, okay, it doesn't seem like any different from sixth grade. So I'm like, okay, it should be fine. Let's, let's, let's go. And then mind you, this, this is the first, um, seventh grade is the first grade where I grew up with where we had different periods and different classes that we had to go to. It wasn't just one teacher anymore. So when I got there, I'm like, okay, so yeah, the, the rumors were true. It is all basically map exams and then a couple homework assignments and that's about it. I'm like thinking like, okay, well, this seems easy. I don't understand why people are complaining about it. And my, my memory might not be super sharp on this. Maybe somebody who had that teacher remembers a bit more, but that was a long, long time ago. I remember these specific things. <clears throat> So I go there and I'm thinking like, okay, it is just literally map exams and a few homework assignments. And then I was one, I was thinking like, okay, well, this is should be cake, really. Like I shouldn't really be bad at this. And I remember like a few weeks went by and then, then like 
close to a month like went by and I, th- I remember we had four map exams and then the first one came along and I'm like wait a minute I totally forgot about this because the other teachers I had had a more traditional style of teaching back in the day in elementary school you know mostly homework um tests projects and all that this was this guy barely did anything it was almost like a college professor saying like okay you got four exams this semester uh and that's it basically so I'm thinking like, okay, I've never really done like courses like that before. So I'm like, and I'm in seventh grade, you know, so I'm like 13, 12, 13. And I'm like, okay, well, I can do this. And then I remembered the first exam I took for the maps, I flunked so badly because I never studied. And it just kind of cut up, uh, caught up on me because I forgot about the exam, really. Because all we would do in class was read a book about things and do that. And then take a map exam. And then I failed the first one miserably. And I'm like, wow, I like, because I pretty much forgot about it. And then I was like, okay, well, I have three more shots. I'm probably not going to get an A. So I better try for at least a B or a C plus. And then I, and then I, the second one came along and I really tried it because I'm like, okay, they're hard, they're hard, they're hard. And then I'm like, wait a minute, this is just a memorization test. All I have to do is memorize where things are. And then that's it. And that that's basically the entire s- s- year or semester or whatever. And then um, and then I got good at that. And then I noticed like, wait, I kind of like this because in the in the cur- curriculum, as we're doing these map exams, we're learning more about that region and, and uh, of the countries and all that. So I'm like thinking like, well, I like this. I think this is interesting. I think it's fun. It's not too hard. It's it's pretty much like uh, set in stone, really. History. There's not much changing and all that, like English or whatever. But uh, and I'm um, or, or science. Science can change. It doesn't really change all that much, but it can change. And then I'm thinking like, this is this is easy. I like this, and I like learning about the world. That's when you kind of learn about like uh, different religions, like Christianity. Buddhism, Islam, all that. It's just, it's, so it's like I'm learning more and more about the world and what we did back in the day. And it was a world history class that we did, like, basically, you start from, like, I want to say, like, we started in Mesopotamia and then we went all the way up to basically, um, where did we end up in? I think it was, like, maybe, like, the beginning of the American Revolution, really. I think it is. I think because in eighth grade, you do world history or U.S. history. And then you go from the American Revolution all the way up until like modern time, I think. And that one's like a, a little a little bit more of an in-depth course. So it's not you don't cover as much, but I think you cover you covered more in depth and all that. And that's when you learn the you learn the preamble and all that. You know, we the people you memorize that, too. And then after. So going back to seventh grade. Um, after that, I did pretty well on the map exams, and that's when I really got hooked. And I'm like, this is inter- interesting stuff. I really like this. I really, I think it's fun to learn. I think it's interesting, and I feel like you learn more about like what happened, how people got there. And I think it's important to to keep all that. And I, and sometimes I think that maybe we should have gone deeper on some topics. Like, um, oh, I think, um, let me think. I remember we really skipped. Um, what was a uh, world war um world war 1 we skipped that pretty uh in 7th grade we skipped that pretty quickly because or 8th grade actually 8th grade um we skipped that one pretty not a, we didn't cover as much as world war 2 and i think that that's important that we you know we cover that one more because i know it doesn't have like the pomp and circumstance of even if you want to put that in a title of a war it doesn't have the gra- gravitas of World War II, but I think it's still an important uh, time period. It's an important um, uh, event. It was supposed to be the the war the war to end all wars, which uh, clearly that did not happen. But I think like some things are in in school in general, um, historical events aren't covered, and I think that they need to be all. We should try to cover as much as possible, and really try to not uh, you know sugarcoat things i think that they need to be told in the raw that way you can feel uh how these people felt learn why they felt this way what was going on at the time the government and all that i think that's very important and i think that when we talk about um going back to why i like it and why i think it's uh it's always been like a hobby of mine and i think 
it, it became a hobby because I didn't want to get, uh, I didn't want to make it my career because I know like in history, you either work in like a museum or, uh, um, you become, become a professor or a teacher. And I'm, I'm thinking like, I, I don't know if I have the ability or the passion enough to teach a class about this. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I don't think that I would be able to um, enjoy myself if I do that because I like learning new things about history and what happened in the past um, pretty much weekly. I try to find, either, whether it be like a podcast or uh, an article or something, or just even like looking stuff up, like, you know, what happened in this period or what happened here. Even if you have found like a YouTube video of like a, like the history channel or something like a topic there you get interested and you get you want to be like what happened during this or what happened during that that's always been like a thing that I've enjoyed doing and I think that you know more people try kind of ignore history they kind of think like oh it's just history what do I why do I have to learn about that uh, why should what we did back in 1917 uh, affect how we do in 1921 well it kind of does because you, we as people, um, I don't think that like our, our capabilities of communication, capabilities of, um, uh, you know, our bodies haven't changed all that much. Our brains haven't changed all that much from, um, when we, you know, you can go back to shoot. I don't even know how far you want to go back, but they haven't changed all that much from then to now, really. We're still kind of the same, I mean, sure, we're a bit like, um, obviously, we have more food, uh, nutritional-wise, we have a better nutrition, um, we grow stronger, like, I remember, like, seeing, like, um, I think it was in, like, a museum or something, I saw, like, a, they had, like, suits of armor from some conflict, I can't remember, but, like, or they, it was, maybe it was a video, I think it was a video in a museum, and the museum and the video, the armor suits were, like, freaking tiny, like, the people there, the, the guy's height were like five foot five, I think, like the average. I'm like, that's short as hell. And I'm thinking like, well, yeah, they had a poor nutrition, probably malnourished, um, very little, no medicine, no healthcare, nothing. And now what's the average? Like maybe like five, eight, five, nine for a, for a man. Um, I'm not sure what the woman's um, height average is, but I'm pretty sure back then it was a lot less too. So it's crazy like um, our ability to... Um, progress in the technology to improve our physical health but like the like our capabilities of learning things back in the day i think stays has stayed the same if not gotten better like if you think about it like how the hell how the hell did the greeks or the egyptians build those giant statues or giant sculptures of whatever they did with the tools that they had today and then but it's like it's crazy like those marble sculptures of like david or whatever the pyramids how like precise all the chippings are the carvings the um the, you know every block is perfectly placed and all that now granted they probably i'm sure they had like thousands and thousands and thousands of slaves doing it but still like they had to have the blueprints to do that it's like it's incredible like the achievements that they did back then so i don't think that um our our um learning capabilities and our our core values our brain power our um ability to communicate our our um our our ability to have empathy sympathy um has changed quite a bit at all i think that what's happening is that people think that we're better than history where we got here doing what we did and now that doesn't matter well yeah it kind of does matter um it does matter because you know that saying: if you if you don't know your history, you're going to repeat it. You you're doomed to repeat it. And for some some areas, I believe that's true. Most of them, I think it's true. I think that if you don't know about some things, one of the big ones is war, right? You always talk about like, why do we have conflicts with um, Germany, Russia, China, you know, North Korea, Korea, whatever, you know, whomever. And then these wars keep happening and happening and happening and happening because we don't really. Um, <clears throat> It's always about building a new weapon, a new technology, a new this or new that or that or whatever, you know, um, developments of this. Why are we so, um, why are we mean to these countries and nice to these ones? Why do we do that for other countries? Or why is, why is this thing like the, one of the big things in conflict in human history 
is the battle between whose religion is better than the others. That's like, you know what I mean? Like, um, well, the conflicts in like, um, in, um, the, the Middle East with uh, ISIS and all that, it's a religious conflict. So it's like, we're going back to like when, um, back in the crusades where that was like a religious, uh, uh, conflict and all that. And it's like, well, it's the same thing today. Like people are mad about if you're Christian, uh, Jewish or Muslim, uh, People still get mad at that, and it's like, we need to learn how to let that stuff go and have the ability to, to reform things and put in new laws and uh, and just get behind that, because if we don't do that, then we're just going to repeat history and get the same conflicts again and again and again, but obviously the technology is better, right? We're not using swords or shields. We have freaking nuclear bombs now. So it's like, yes, history is important because we don't want to repeat those steps in nowadays when we can freaking like blow up the goddamn planet. So it's like, yes, history is important. Um, if you don't want to teach it, and I know it's probably, for some people, a very, very boring subject. I get that. But I think that in the way, it's you should always try to, uh, try to um, learn something new in history as much as you can. Because it's very, very, very important. It's very important. And I think that it's also kind of fun. It's kind of funny. You can go on like this journey of how, you know, we got we went from here... And then we got there, and there, and there, and there, into the future, and now we're here. It's it's pretty incredible to 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 think, like, <clears throat> if you want to take a uh, let's take a journey back in time, and we go back to um, oh I don't know, let's say like seventeen um seventy six right 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 uh Revolutionary War time. What was like one of the best? Do you think that um best technologies that we had? trying to think what do we have um we had the musket um a new uh, an actual gun think about this we now had a a, a a device that was able to shoot a metal ball at high rates of speed and kill somebody with that right let's go all the way back to maybe 16 um 20 i don't even know when the first like okay before weapons were um guns were created um what were they using swords shields bow and arrow uh, crossbow um, all using something that was you used your um, your physicality, right? You use your muscles for, like pulling back a bow, uh, shooting a, a crossbow. Again, it's using like a string to propel something, but like, or a sword or a shield that uses, you know, manpower, right? We were using these weapons that, that basically we had to get up and close, except for bows and arrows and crossbows, but we had to get up close and personal, to use to actually you know engage in conflict and engage in a war and fighting now you don't even have to do that whatsoever right if we're technically in like if if we're like let's say we go into world war three right um nobody's gonna be deployed we're not gonna use any troops or soldiers i believe it's gonna be a drone attack um you know drone strikes um potentially a nuclear which i hope that never happens it's it's war has evolved so much through history like it's it's crazy because the technology kept getting bigger and bigger but our mentality of like we need to conquer this place we need to get this we need to overtake these people we need to stop these people from doing what they're doing that has stayed the same the technology has just made it easier and in my in my uh, opinion uh, you know, with nukes, um, drone strikes, airstrikes, missiles, um, bombs, mines, whatever. In my mind, it's gotten a little bit more. It's 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 so easy to inflict a a death upon people. You know, in war, it's so easy. I mean, you think about World War One. That was one of the most gruesome, disgusting, dirty, um, bloody, um, brutal wars ever fought. Right. I mean, like, if you think about it, it was like the almost like the dawn of modern warfare. Right. We have two sides that are that have gone from um, old like civil war, two lines of soldiers going at each other from a distance. Right. You shoot, they shoot, you shoot, they shoot. We we're still uh, kind of in that a little bit What I mean, like with trenches and lines and no man's land and all that and divisions and in fronts and all that. We we're still sort of in that mentality of okay, this is our side, this is your side. Now we want to try to get to your side, that way that could be our side, and then you have to go back and make a new side. So we are still in that kind of mentality there, 
but we're using in the and we have bombs, artillery, um, aircraft. We have uh, the first tanks, um, mines, um, gas. Right. So we're using like these really, really um, deadly forces, but up and up close and personal. Still, kind of like we're not like having like engaging like miles and miles away. Really, you maybe like artillery and aircraft, but like for the most part. You know, you're you're separated for like maybe like a hundred, a couple hundred yards. You know, it's not that far away, and we're using like these deadly, deadly, brutal uh, ways of killing people nowadays. If we're like, I was talking to like one of my friends like way back in the day, it might have been like in 2019, but we were talking about like, what if we do go into World War Three? And he was saying like, this is going to be the most. If we do go into World War Three, and we do have like a big old conflict with some other country that really just you know. And it's like, when I, t- when I say we are going to war with somebody, I'm not saying like this per- this country has like been doing things and now we got to go and police it and we got to go um, do that. And we- Don't get me wrong, that is still a conflict and a, and, and a war. But when I'm talking about like a war war, like when people declare war on each other, we're like, okay, you've- this is the end. This is the last straw. We are going at it one one person wins, one person loses. That's it. And he was saying, like, if we actually go to a, like a legit war, when somebody declares war on us, or we declare war on them, it's going to be the cleanest war ever. Most devastating, with lives lost. Like probably the most devastating with li- as as in the terms of lives being lost. But it will be the most clean one because we have. We no longer really send troops into like a city or a town. We use we use a jet or a drone, or we launch a bomb or something, so we're not going to be able, we won't be able to um, risk the lives of our troops as much as we would back in the day, like in World War One. so in the term of um, blowing up, um, obviously you have civilians and all that, but like, in the terms of like seeing like, like man-to-man combat, like shooting at each other, them that's probably going to reduce a lot more if we're actually going to like an actual world war three like legit like us versus russia us versus china or you know i i I don't see like a lot of you know man-to-man actual soldier to soldier combat i i I think that's kind of phased out a bit because for a, a good reason is because now we don't want to lose anybody's life right back in the day um, like in um World War One, World War Two, there, there wasn't as much uh journalism in the wars, so we didn't really know what was happening, um, you know, in happening in Germany, France, whatever. We didn't know that it was all up until like, you know, Vietnam, where the journalists were like being more prominent and reporting, and stuff was getting back to the U.S. and all that, and we actually really saw the people at home saw as it was happening, how bad it is, and how we, why do we have people there and doing this for, the, like, in the first place, you know, and I'm not, I'm not going to comment on Vietnam or where I stand on Vietnam, but, like, if, if, when people see those photos and we see what's happening, there's obviously going to be a gut reaction of, like, well, why are we doing this? These are our boys and, like, what's happening? So, the, I feel like back in the day, like, way back in, like, medieval times, nobody cared about their lives, lost really they did in a way but they knew that that was the only way to win the war now we don't really have to do that because we have missiles and bombs and drones and jets so it's like it's almost become like war has become like this uh strategic threat let's just threaten people threaten you with a nuke or whatever and hopefully that you back down right because if you think about it i don't see like any like any of us the major countries really launching a nuke at anybody ever because I think that they know that I think they know that if you do that, you might let's say you launch one nuke, one nuke on the US, one nuke on you know anybody. Um, the country who did that, um, they're gonna be like probably gonna be attacked with like all the nukes. You know what I mean? Because I think you don't just go one nuke and one nuke. I think if you do one nuke, if somebody does the first nuke, who actually launches it at um, another country, that country who launched it is going to probably be dead. 
because I feel like the I, in a way I feel like in war you shouldn't be allowed to use the nuke because not only does it cause massive damage to lives and and destruction of cities and towns and all that and especially civilians but it also harms the planet a lot like you launch that and that that town is going to be radiated with radiation for a long long time so that's why I hate nukes man I hate like why the the, the, the we the, it's such a it was such a bad move with creating like a we need to make this big big bomb like why <laughs> that's it's, it just like ruined like and everybody's threatening people with the nuke it's like oh this is just horrible like i don't even like having the nukes it's just like because i'm scared like what if we do get into a nuclear war then it's like well the planet's going to be done bro like not only are we going to kill our enemies but the planet's going to be pretty in bad shape at that point so it's like we have this weapon that'll not only kill people, but kill the planet. So it's like, I don't, I don't agree with that, man. It's like, it's just crazy. And that's how, and that's how like you, know, you all kind of tie back into history being like repeating itself. Like we made this now or wars continuing. They're always going to continue because we can never get along in the first place because we don't go back and see why, why these people um, started a fighting in the first place. We never go back and do that because I, we think that we're we've you know ascended farther in life and that we we no longer do that but in in the same time they say one thing they say another thing we get pissed off and then we go to war so it's like how are we we're not remembering history here we're forgetting it we're forgetting it now that we've gone so far into the future with te with technology that can cause devastating upon devastating um repercussions of what happens to us and the planet we're kind of stuck and we're kind of fucked. It's really fucked up. Like, it's such a bad situation to be in because nobody wants to be the first person to uh, push that button and and uh, say, "Well, you're gonna be bombed with a nuke. Good luck." It's like, ah, oh. it's just hard to you know um, think that we have all these uh, weapons that literally will wipe out a city within a within a second. You know, it's crazy, man. It really is, and that's why history is important because we need to know that just because like we don't get along or we we can get along, we but we're not. We need to try to um, put in some more effort into doing it, not just being like so tied down to what we believe in and what we do as a country or a state or a city state or um, you know a nation, whatever. You know, we need to try to uh, um, try to get along with these people is better and i think that won't because we don't do that and that technology has advanced so far we need to do it now more than ever because we we are in a possession of technology that just is too big for us to handle like what i was saying like back in the day when people were willing to send you know soldiers into different uh towns and just like get the job done, get the job done. We need to win this here and now. We need to win this. We might lose some men. We might not. It's all a gamble. And I know that you should always go into war with having the risk that you are going to lose people. That's very important. That you need to know that if you're going to declare war, you need to already know that there's a big risk and that you're going to lose people. You need to have that already in you. That's going to happen. But now that it's happening, it continues to happen, and that people. Um, just, it's like, we're almost like unaware of how much power that we have and how devastating that it could be. And I think we just need to look back on history and say, Hey, um, this is happening again and again and again. And, but now it's just even more on a magnitude that we can't really, uh, it's t almost too big for us and it needs to read up on history, read up on it. It's interesting. It's fun, but it, it can also help people in the future of why these conflicts happen, how they can be prevented, I hope, and just like, you know, for the better, for the greater good. Hopefully that, that'll that happen. Well, that was a bit of a tangent. <laughs> I did not expect to do that. I thought that was, uh, but it was, yeah, I, I, that is kind of what I think about history. I think it's very important. I think that war is bad. And that we we keep doing it because we don't remember history. We don't remember why this is happening, why it happens, and why this is uh, 
still occurs and that we need to fix it. And then the only way we can fix it is we, if we learn upon the mistakes that we've done in the past. So hopefully that uh, encourages more people to get into history and to learn about history and, and want to know why we are where we are. What did we do in the back then that maybe prevented us from progressing faster or what stunt our progression or what happened or what, 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 you know, how did this happen or how did this um, affect the way that we live today? You know, it's just, it's, it's very interesting and it's um, something that I think it's not very hard to grasp really. You just kind of learn it, you read it, you memorize it and you have some fun. You know, it's, 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 it's learning about us people, human beings humanity and how we've stumbled and falled and all that and it's just like it's one big story of how um we got to this point and i think it's very important to read up on and learn about Ooh, baby baby um i wanted to talk about something that i haven't really talked about all that much on this podcast and it's about the video game industry and if you know me you okay what i do is i like to uh i critique a lot of things it's what I do. I, I, I always have a say in something. I always want to, you know, be vocal about it. I always want to chime in because I feel like I never, I always, well, if I agree with somebody on something and I, and I, and I see things another way, I always try to, uh, try, uh, I'm a very, I'm not a yes or no guy. You know that. Um, but let's get to this news story. It's about Microsoft completing the purchase of Bethesda Softworks for $7.5 billion. Uh, if you don't know, Microsoft is a big company. They um, they make computers, obviously Windows software. They own X. They made Xbox back in the day. They, uh, they, have, they make surfaces. They make a lot of technologies that you can use. And, and this is their video game division of making Xboxes and Xbox uh, Series X, Series X, or X and S. Um, and they just completed their purchase of Bethesda Softworks. And if you don't know who the who Bethesda is, Bethesda is if you are a gamer and you are a fan of the Elder Scrolls, whether it be Oblivion or Skyrim or even the ones of the past, um, Fallout, Fallout 3, Fallout uh, 4, Fallout 76. Um, I'm not sure about New Vegas, but they make those games. They, they, they develop and publish uh, those video games and those video games are very very popular um, to a lot of people including me I enjoyed Skyrim a lot when it came out I enjoyed Fallout 4 when it came out and I know that a lot of people didn't I did and I you know for some time when it first came out and whenever I would play with my friends I enjoyed Fallout 76 I will tell you this now I no longer play the game because I feel like the game is so um, grindy. I'm not a fan of grindy games. I never really have been. Um, and, and Fallout 76 is one of the ones that I try to get into because I, I I enjoy Fallout. I enjoy that world and I I enjoy that game and the way that it feels and the way it plays and I I, I like the game. Um, but I could not get into it. I could not continue to like literally like just waste my time on that game. It just got to a point where I was just like. I can't do this anymore. I'm done. Um, if people enjoy it, great for them. I cannot do it. Um, and then I remember, like, the, when it first came out, man, um, they, it was so... If you played Fallout, you know that the quests are, and the main story, is semi-good. It's a good story. It's decent. It's got voiceover. It's got people who uh, different characters, uh, different, uh, you know, locations, different story arcs different quests, uh, and Fallout 76, when it first came out, you literally just go on a scavenger hunt for this robot, and, like, that's, like, the entire thing for the first, the first, like, the very beginning of the game, and I didn't get very far, and I was just like, this is boring as hell, I'm done, I'm out of this, I, I can't do this, like, this is everything that I didn't want it to be, um, it's very, it's very, it's, it's done very half ass. It's, uh, like a little effort is in it. I, I don't feel like I'm playing a good fallout game. I feel like it's just like a, it should be free. I felt that it was so like, you need friends to play it because playing it by yourself is just an absolute hell. And, you know, I think that that was maybe, maybe because of the, the direction, the, um, 
whoever was in charge at Bethesda at that time, it was just like, we need to promote Fallout. We need to get a new Fallout game out. Let's do this and uh, and kind of make it secretive and not tell them the full details on it. And I'm like, when it comes out, it's like, oh, this is like kind of bullshit. This, this kind of sucks. So I... I'm like, okay, Bethesda, you kind of ruined me, uh, wrecked me. You've made some very good games, but this one is kind of a stick in the mud. I, I don't play Dishonored. I don't play, uh, I guess you could say Wolfenstein. I've never played Wolfenstein, but I have played the one of their bigger games in like Fallout and Elder Scrolls, and I like them pretty uh, pretty decently. But now they're being owned by Microsoft, and I think that this is a good decision because I think that this will now hopefully... Um, put Bethesda in a better position to make better games. I think that they needed a new coach, um, being a little bit of, of a sports analogy, or a new GM, if that, or a new owner. They needed new ownership. They weren't doing it with their old owners uh, because I think uh, Zenith something owned them or something. I can't remember who. Uh, but they were owned by somebody else. Uh, and uh, But now that Microsoft bought them, I feel that they have a new ownership, new general manager, new coach, and that they can go into a brighter future with Xbox. And that there's like, a, they've so far the games that they've released or announced actually are um, going to be Elder Scrolls Six, um, Starfield, a new Indiana Jones game uh, that's being and that's coming out in the future. We're not sure when. These all have been teased, but no dates or no announcements after that. So, yeah, I hope that um, Microsoft can uh, whip Bethesda Softworks into shape because they need it. They know that they laid an egg with um, uh, Fallout 76, but all you need is a good game and everything is good. Everything will be solid. It's like winning a game in any sport. You're on a losing streak. You do bad. You're doing poorly. There's drama. There's uh, bad decisions. There's... uh, complications all you need is one good game one win and that all washes away and everything is forgettable and every everybody's forgiven we just need one really good game and they kind of got me to thinking like these new games that they've announced already like elder scrolls 6 starfield and indiana jones um are these going to be exclusively on xbox or are they going to be on uh playstation and pc as well well what i mean by exclusively on Xbox also will be on PC with Xbox because PC and Xbox, you know, Microsoft. So, um, that'll, that's why, um, I got to thinking like, let's say, okay, if they make a new fallout game and a new elder, elder scrolls game, I don't think that any of those would be on, uh, just Xbox and PC. They would be on, have to be on PlayStation because I feel like those franchises are already on PlayStation. They're already on... Some of them are already on Switch. Um, so I think if you do that, if you take it away from them, then that's just... And that's already like a bigger... Everybody already plays those games on every platform, really. So why would you do that? I feel like you would be losing money on that and already an existing IP like Fallout and Elder Scrolls. So like, I would say no to that because... You have already a big audience on Xbox and PS5, so I feel like if you just put that exclusively on Xbox and PC, that would be you would lose a lot on that market for um, Elder Scrolls and Fallout. So no, I, I, those games I feel like they won't be exclusively exclusivity on Xbox, um, but maybe future titles will, um, and that's what uh, Phil Spencer did say that like some titles in the future would be exclusively on Xbox and PC. So I'm thinking that potentially, possibly, the new Indiana Jones could potentially be the exclusive on Xbox. Now, why would I say this? Why would I think that? Indiana Jones is so well-known. He's a very popular IP, very popular character. Um, And and I got to thinking, like, this is what I think. I was thinking... um, there's also another popular character that has been known worldwide, love all around the world. Kids love him, adults love him, everybody loves him. That is Spider-Man. That and not I'm not talking about movies or anything like that. I'm talking about video games and, and in the context of video games, Spider-Man is potentially only a PlayStation exclusive as of lately. Um 
it started with it started with the um, PS4 version of Spider-Man, and then the Miles Morales one, and now that there's there's um, I believe that the Spider-Man and the Marvel's Avengers game is going to be exclusively a, a DLC character only on PlayStation. And when I heard that news, I was thinking like these guys at Sony, how do they have the nerve to make Spider-Man? Only on the PlayStation, only on, like, I, I not even on PC, only PlayStation. Hmm, um, I was thinking, like, why would they do that? I mean, do they think, obviously, do they honestly think that Spider-Man alone is going to make them buy a new console? Like, if, I, if I'm an Xbox guy, and, or somebody else is a PC guy, right, I, I don't see myself buying an entirely new console to play my favorite character, even though he is my favorite character. Which he isn't for me, but if he was, I don't think I would buy a PlayStation 5 just to play one Spider-Man game. You know what I mean? I feel like that when they do that, that is a bit of a... It, it almost like... Because I have a loyalty to Xbox. I'm an Xbox guy. That's why I when there's like games that are exclusively on PlayStation that are going to be out on Xbox, potentially, I don't buy a PlayStation. I wait till they become available on Xbox because I know I'm a loyal a, a loyal customer when it comes to Xbox. I don't want to play another platform. I don't want to have to make a switch and buy another $500 console to buy to play one game. I feel like that's just so uh it's just it's so I don't know, man. It's just like that's such a weak move for for like Sony to do that. Like <laughs> the world loves Spider-Man, but you can only play a Spider-Man on the PlayStation 5. Like, what What the hell is that? And I get it. Like, PlayStation sells so many consoles. They have some of the better uh, exclu- ex- exclusive games. When it comes to Uncharted, uh, The Last of Us, Spider-Man, uh, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. They have a lot of good exclusive games that you can't deny the numbers. They sell very popularly. They sell big and then they sell... A lot. They sell a lot, and everybody plays them. Everybody likes them. Who, who usually who buys them, and is just you know they make they make their cash money on that. And I'm thinking like, well, okay, Xbox, if you want to do this, and they've already said that they are some of them will be exclusively on Xbox and PC, right? You need to make Indiana Jones your exclusive. You need to have a big IP to compete with Spider-Man. Now, I know that the popularity on Indiana Jones is probably nowhere near as high in in gamer in, with gamers as Spider-Man might be. But I feel like if you're going to play dirty like Sony does, if you're going to go that way, and I encourage you to do that because you need to because you need more exclusives because frankly, you lose every battle when it comes to um selling consoles against Sony. Right, it happens like every generation of consoles. You need to make some uh, big choices, and I think that if you make Indiana Jones and Starfield, and exclusively on Xbox and PC, that's going to make you a bit more competitive when it comes to exclusives within a, in the exclusive game area. Because I think you need a property or an IP to just do that. Like I feel like if you do that and everybody, and if it looks like a great game, you're gonna get a little bit of a taste of what it's like for Sony to do that with Spider Man, because if they can do that with Spider Man, you can do that with Indiana Jones, and nobody should be mad about you about that because nobody's mad about Spider Man only being on PS5 or PS4. Nobody's mad about that. So if you do that with Indiana Jones, I feel like nobody's gonna really bat an eye. They'll be like, oh, that's their exclusive. Oh, it's going to compete with Spider-Man because now they have a big IP. Because all really Xbox really has for um, an exclusives is Gears of War and Halo. And don't even get me started on Halo Infinite. Okay, you already did. Um, I cannot tell you how in how embarrassed I am, how insulting this makes me, how how much it shows upon Xbox and 343 of how they've... Now, this could be completely gone when the game comes out this fall. It could be completely evaporated and gone. But the way that they've managed 
this game in particular, the way that they've produ- they've they've shown it out, and the, the way that they've um, marketed it, the way that they have like just been their updates on this, the way that they just always seem to like get a make me have bad feelings and bad vibes about this game is unmeasurable to any other developer that I've ever seen. And I'm talking about 343 Industries. When they first showed us gameplay of Halo Infinite, and this was back in the summer of 2020, I will say this. Well, it played well. The game played like Halo. It played like classic Halo, fighting elites, fighting grunts, fighting brutes, doing all that good stuff, driving a warthog. I'm like, good. It, it, the gameplay feels and looks good. It feels like Halo. It looks like Halo. But when I saw the graphics, and I'm like thinking, like, there is no way that these guys are putting their time into good use and making it look the best that they can. And literally everybody on the internet was saying, like, this game doesn't look very good. This game looks pretty bad. Like, this cannot be next-gen. And I remember, like, the ray tracing in Xbox hasn't, like, made it yet. Made it there to the Series X. X. So I'm thinking, like, okay, maybe that'll help it a lot more, I hope. And then shortly after, they decided to uh, delay the game an entire year. And I'm thinking, like, wait a minute. Were these guys, were these motherfuckers about to release a uh, shitty-looking game on us? And the outcry, the the absolute massive worldwide outcry on the internet from the fans, from gamers, from um, uh, uh, media outlets. Did we catch 343 Industries about to sell us a half-ass game? And I think we did, baby. I think we did. Because immediately, immediately after that, they said, delayed to 2021. And I, at that point, I'm like a, a bit of a mixed bag because I'm pissed off because I don't get to play another Halo game for another year at least. But I'm also happy because we caught those guys, right? We caught them because they were legit about to sell us a new game, a shitty looking game that was supposed to be on a, the next gen consoles at the time. And I'm thinking like, oh my lord. And now they delayed it an entire year. Which made me think, like, these motherfuckers weren't even done at all. And then it was so weird because when the fall came in 2020, you got all these promotions of Taco Bell, Fortnite, Master Chief in the game, Master Chief uh, Halo Infinite. And then you're like, oh man, they missed on this. They were legit about to release it because they couldn't just not play their ads. They paid for them. They were They were getting ready to sell the uh the halo infinite and i remember my brother got the xbox series x and it had a picture on the back of master chief in, in halo infinite and i'm thinking like wow these guys pulled the plug on that game to come out that fall like that like it was like it was like they were getting the shipping ready for the the consoles the ad marketing the promotions fortnite everything was all lined up for this they were about to sell us a shitty shitty looking game and they didn't so i'm half mad half happy half mad you were about to sell us a bullshit game happy thank god you listened to what we were saying because your game looked like trash it did i'm sorry and i was thinking like i i'm a halo fan i'm going to get the game to play it because i'm a halo fan i want to play it as soon as possible i want to know what happens but I was like, I'm going to wait on my Xbox Series X. Because from what I've seen, this doesn't look like I need to upgrade my console for. It just didn't. And, you know, that is like one their main exclusive. That is their main exclusive, Halo. It's a cultural phenomenon. Video game icon. Master Chief. You, you can't fuck that up anymore you already have twice halo 4 not that great halo 5 trash right um story wise when i play halo i enjoy the multiplayer 
but I want a good story. Halo 1, 2, 3, ODST, Reach. Incredible stories. Like I, One gets repetitive a bit, but it's, it's, it's expected to come out like 20, 2001. Halo 2 revolutionized Halo. Halo 3 finished the fight. Incredible, my favorite Halo. ODST, um, a bit of a dud, in my opinion. A bit boring, um, but that's okay. Um, Reach, incredible game. Incredible story, incredible characters. Just absolutely incredible. Four, okay. And it shouldn't be okay. You're Halo. You should be great. Greater. Going better. I mean, if you think about it. The studio is called 343 Industries. You're literally... Your job, your sole job is to develop Halo games. You don't make anything else. You don't, you're not like EA or DICE. Um, you're not like Activision or Infinity Ward. You're not like Treyarch. Well, you are kind of like Treyarch or Infinity Ward. But you, all you do is you develop Halo games. Your name, 343, is the name of Guilty Spark. 343 Guilty Spark. So when I see how the, the Halo dedicated developers can't make a good Halo game, I get a little bit fed up. Because that is your job. You took that from Bungie. You were handpicked by Microsoft, by everybody in that company, to, all right, Bungie, they're not going to develop any more Halo games. This new studio that we made, 343 Industries, will. And we've handpicked everybody. Maybe some people from Bungie came in to help. Uh, Microsoft people. Everybody, we assemble this team. Now we're going to make the best Halo games ever. Four, they try to make Halo their own. Make it different, and in that in that um, in that process, they made it one of the worst games. And what I'm talking about, I'm not talking about story, but the way the worst like gameplay level designs in Halo that I've ever seen, and it continued in Halo Five. It continued in Halo Five. Now, from what I've heard, Gears Five is very good. Very, very, very good. Incredible game. I don't play Gears. I'm not a Gears fan, but I've heard that Gears is incredible and is a very, very worthy sequel in continuation of that story. And like it may be a little bit of a, a... I don't think it's a reboot. I think it's just a continuation of that story. But I feel like Halo is so badly damaged that it needs... And, 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 and Xbox should know this, that they need more exclusives to sell gamers because... If you think about it, who's going to buy, who's the main audience of people who play Halo? Me, my friends, people over the age of 24 are probably the biggest fans of Halo. But who is the biggest, uh, what's the biggest age group in that market of video games? Who, who, who plays the most video games? Little kids. Fortnite guys. Those guys are the big market in the in the video game market, video game industry. They are the target audience. They need to sell a Halo game that can appease them. And I get that. I, you, you make it more modern. You take away a bit of the uh, classic um, feel that made Halo Halo. Because you kind of have to. And it's a shame, but it, it, that's just how it is. But I feel like all of their effort kind of went into the multiplayer and not the story, even though that the story is what makes Halo Halo. Multiplayer does too, but let's be real. The story of Master Chief Cortana, the Arbiter, is really... It's a, it's an incredible story set in an incredible air, uh, world, and it's, it's just awesome to play. And I feel like if you lose that sight... And you solely become this multiplayer focused um, video game. You're gonna lose. You lose your magic, I think, because you kind of lose the identity of what makes a Halo game a Halo game, and how you could kind of recapture the audiences, and recapture the masses, and even restore trust and loyalty to your fan base right now. Because I feel like if you do too much of one, um, you'll lose people. So I get that Halo Infinite is a great, great task. 
And it's a great, it's a big opportunity for you to really gain back the, the people who you lost in Halo 5, which you did lose a lot, including me. I mean, holy crap. I'm trying to replay the campaign, and that is probably the worst campaign of all time. Literally, it is. Because every mission is following a trail or a path, whether it be, you know, in an actual, like, a, a tunnel or, like, in a somewhat semi-open world type thing. You never have an option to go one way or the other. You only go one way. And that happened to Halo 4 and Halo 5. And it was one of the most, like, oh, I can't believe that they actually made it that way. You play, you replay them again, and you're like, this is such lazy map making, such a lazy story. It's like, what, what were they thinking, man? That's why I think that exclusives on Xbox, the future of Xbox exclusives, is very important that you land a good one. And I think that Indiana Jones, whether it be in an adventure style, open world type game, can really hit home with the Xbox community and people who like Indiana Jones who don't play Xbox to get that and to build the exclusive library on Xbox because that is essential now. I think that they've been, Xbox has been playing like this game of we don't need exclusives all that much. We need multiplayer, multiplayer games. But in the end, um, you know, we still lose out in sales to Sony, to PlayStation, and everything like that. And then they played it off like the future is Game Pass. And we want to make sure that you have the most game options to play. You want you have all these options to play. And then you can play whatever you want, when you want. But at the end of the day, if you think about that. And I, and I kind of like almost take Game Pass and Netflix as the same thing. Here's what I mean by that. When you look at Netflix, you open the Netflix catalog and you look at all the things that they have. They have action movies, uh, dramas, uh, comedies. They have TV shows, uh, documentaries, stand-up comedy sets, uh, um, animation. Uh, they have a huge library of all these things. And they have uh, also their, their uh, Netflix originals. They have... Um, they had The Office for a while, and now that's gone. They had like so many different iconic shows there, and movies, and series, and documentaries, and all that. They had a big, big catalog of all that stuff, and their library was, at the time, when it first was starting up, and everybody had Netflix, back in like maybe 2015 or 16, they had like, it was like the go-to service, and in that, you know, having all those uh, series, shows, and all that, when you look at it on that screen on the library, you're like, wow, I have so much to choose from. But nothing seems all that special to me. You know what I mean? Like, it's because you have access to everything. And you don't really feel like anything really pops out at you because you have literally everything there. Nothing really grabs my attention. Maybe like a word of mouth or your friend said this or that. Like, oh, yeah, check that out. I'll watch that or whatever. But if you're just, like, looking for things to watch, most of the time I find myself just looking and, like, what do I watch? I heard that's good. That that looks cool. That looks bad. I heard that's bad. I'm going to watch that. I heard that's pretty good. I might watch that. But you never really do. So I feel like the same thing happens on Xbox Game Pass. You have all these options of all these different types of games and for a casual gamer like myself, or who's not really, you know, considered a true pro gamer, if you look at the catalog and the, the library is like, wow, this is a lot of games. This is a ton of games. I heard that one's good. That one's pretty good, I think. Uh, that one I heard is pretty bad. You know, the same thing happens all over again. And then you're like, well, I have so many games to choose from. I don't know what to choose from. It almost seems like they're not, they don't feel as special to you. They don't feel like, you remember when you were a kid and you saved up saved up for your game and you bought that game and then you played that game until you beat it multiple times on end and then you're like, ah, oh, I feel great. That meant something. That that felt rewarding. That was cool. That was a fun game, a good story, a good good characters, good everything. Nowadays, when I see the, the library on Game Pass, I'm like, ah, oh, okay. There's so much to choose from and even when I do pick a game you might not beat it because you go back and see what's on game pass oh okay so it's like in a way game pass is a great thing because it's a subscription based thing you can try out games you can try out multiple games 
and it's it's a way to experience uh, different games on a subscription based uh, platform. You don't have to actually buy them; you download them and then you play them. And then when they go off Game Pass, you can't play them anymore. So it's like that's cool. It's it's all about like in the now of you need to play this game now before it's gone. You know what I mean? So I enjoy that aspect of it. I think it's cool because you can get uh, the variety is crazy, but at the same time for me the the specialness of the video game that I want to play is kind of diminished and it's kind of like just gone into like this I feel like I'm in this Netflix um limbo of like what do I play I don't know what to play and will I finish it maybe not maybe maybe not it, it's kind of a, like it, it almost goes like to like do you appreciate physical media or are you all digital uh, like when you buy like a digital game you know what, it's it's actually not, because, like, if I buy a game digital, I still play it a lot, because I own it, basically, kind of, you know, I pretty much own it, um, so, like, that's different, when I download it on Game Pass, I don't own it, so it will be taken away eventually, but, so Microsoft has, like, an, uh, a choice here, they either make their exclusives more, clearly all the exclusives are going to be on game pass we get that but it was like a kind of a thing where it was like are they fully just going to be we want to have every game on game pass and that'll be it if they're going to make exclusives from bethesda clearly i think that they had a shift in a business strategy of how to get more people to play xbox i think and i'm not saying that game pass numbers are down or up or whatever i'm not sure at this moment but i'm pretty sure that they're pretty good but i think that they know that console gamers and gamers in general we do like those exclusives because that shows that you put in the time and the effort and care and love into making this game feel different to feel um that it was uh great um i mean you look at playstation all their exclusives you hear great things about them and I, i i didn't even mention god of war that's another big one too. So it's like having a multitude of games is great, but also having a core like five that only you get to play and are usually pretty damn good. It makes you feel like better. Like I made the right purchase. Like I'm getting the most out of this console. So I think that Xbox, you need more exclusives that you put heart and care into. And I think that your sales and consoles will go up. More than with just Game Pass. Alright, let's talk about WandaVision. Let's talk about it. WandaVision, if you didn't know, completed its series uh, last Friday. And um, I thought it was a good uh, series finale. I thought it was pretty good. I thought it was decent. I thought it was uh, it was, it was exactly how the show should have ended, in my opinion. With Wanda and Vision. And with them. That's what it was called, WandaVision. End with them. You don't need anything else. I think that um, if you... Oh, and I, I kind of went on Twitter after to see what the reaction was like. Because I, I watch it immediately like when it comes out like at midnight on the West Coast. So at midnight, 12 a.m., I saw it and I'm like... Once it was finished, I'm like, that was good. It was, it was a good series, which I didn't know at the time was going to be the series finale. But it was a good series finale. It did the... To the job, and I feel like if you think about it, it's just one big six hour long movie. And so far, we don't know if the um Falcon and the Winter, Sol- Winter Soldier is going to get a second season. I don't think that they are, so it's going to be like another same thing a big long movie, like a six part, or, or in this case, WandaVision was a nine part movie. So you got a big long WandaVision movie. Uh, it, it was it was good. I liked it. I thought it was good. I thought it ended well. I thought it uh, answered a lot of questions. I thought it also left some open to uh, to uh, 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 theorize about, to conspire, to uh, think about, and to look up into Google search and to uh, theorize. But I thought it was good. I thought it, I thought it was really happy about it. But I went on to Twitter and I saw like people were like, also it was good. I kept seeing like. Why they were like me thinking that Doctor Strange was going to be in the show, and then like me being sad that Doctor Strange was not in the show. So I was thinking like, wait a minute, why why would you think that Doctor Strange would be in that show? 
I was thinking about that. I'm like, what, what, what made them think that Doctor Strange would be in that show? It's called WandaVision. You know, like there was, I, I don't under, I, I know that Doctor Strange is a, wiz, a wizard and that Wanda was a witch, but I, I, I still don't, I don't, I don't, I didn't get an, uh, I didn't draw the lines or connect the dots to why Doctor Strange would be in that show. I, I thought that if he would be in that show, that it wouldn't fit really. And I, I know that like towards the end of that episode, the finale, they kind of like, we're talking about like, oh, so the Wizard Supreme or Supreme Sorcerer or Chalupa Supreme, whatever, um, that he was not as powerful as the Scarlet Witch. And it's like, OK, well, there's a name drop. So he might be in the next movie or she might be in his movie or something like that. So it's like, OK, that's kind of all you really need. Like, right. Like the show and the story of, of the reality and the hex, it was pretty much like there's no reason for Doctor Strange to be in this. So I'm completely fine with it. You know what I mean? Like, and I think like people were also expecting like, oh, this should have been like a big end game type thing or big end game type ending. Um, but like, why would that happen? Like Wanda did her thing. She um, uh, solved her conflict and defeated the bad guy, Agatha. So like all is well, right? But yeah, I thought it was solid. I thought it was good. I thought the show did again. Like I said last podcast, it did dip for me, um, but I did. I thought it ended solidly. I didn't think that we needed any anything else. Like, and I don't think that Doctor Strange would have helped out. I I did think that they kind of uh, did uh, Quicksilver a bit dirty um, with the uh, boner thing. That was eh, kind of uh, it was kind of stupid. Um, but at the end of the day, I thought it was a solid show. I thought it uh, it definitely kept me entertained. I kept checking back in every week. So, yeah, I watched it. I saw it. Um, isn't that all really what you want to be able to do with the show? Does it retain your attention? And it did for me. So, I'm like, yeah, it was good. Um, I, I'm not going to outrage or, like, complain about something that, sh- that I thought should have been in the show. When in purpose and in, 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 uh, in writing it, when I saw it, I'm like, no, Doctor Strange does not need to be in this. It would be – it would disservice. It would It would be little – Wanda and Vision. It would like take the spotlight away from Wanda and Vision, and uh, it would be oh, it's now the Doctor Strange show, and now we're gonna be like oh, he was behind this and that, and he did this, and he was secretly there. And it's like no, we don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need it to be so. And I know that a lot of people were speculating about because uh, Elizabeth Olsen was saying like we're gonna have like a Luke Skywalker sized cameo in our show. And I, I just heard the, the headline, and I didn't really look into it because I, I, I was like, okay, well, if they do, that, that'd that be pretty cool. But like it kind of like washed over me. Like I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll look out for that. I think that was before the season started or the series. Um, and I thought it was Quicksilver, like um, Evan Peters. So I'm like, okay, was that it? If that was it, that was pretty freaking awesome because I liked that. I enjoyed that a lot. I thought it was pretty cool. And, um, yeah, so I was just like, well, okay, if that's not it, I thought that that was it when I saw it. I'm like, oh, that's it. Cool. But then people were like saying, where's the, the, the cameo? Like, well, I thought, I thought, I seriously thought, thought that that was it. And then people were like, oh, it wasn't that, uh, and it wasn't, uh, they could have had Dr. Strange. I'm like, oh, whatever, man. In my opinion, WandaVision did the job that it needed to do. It told the story of, and, and gave more backstory on Wanda and Vision and their relationship, and it, it did its job. Was it a filler show at some times? Yeah, I think it was. Some people will probably say it was only filler, or all you did was learn about Wanda and Vision, and if you already knew about them, and like you didn't need the show, I'm sorry you felt that way. But in um, in my opinion, I thought it did a great job of sharing Wanda and Vision, um, who they were, what they were all about, their relationship. I thought, I'm like, well, okay, I didn't know much about these two, except for a couple episodes when they were kind of, you know, doing things with flashbacks. Um, but I learned more about them. I thought that that was the show's purpose, and I thought it did, and it stuck the landing. I think that it did a very good job with that, and I would give it a solid 8.1 out of 10. N- not a not a incredible review, but not a bad review either. Just a, a, a good, solid review. It was a good show. I liked it. I thought it was fun. Um, if you haven't watched it, 
I, I encourage you to watch it and make your up your own opinion about it. And uh, yeah, so WandaVision, pretty good show. Um, looking forward to the Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Hopefully that that's good. Hopefully that that um, it, it it's gonna it looks like it's gonna be back into the more basic Marvel type cinematic uh, universe uh, adventure action and all that. So that's gonna be cool to see again. And well, hopefully that that's gonna be good because I'm in, I really want to see where that takes, uh, especially Falcon because I think Anthony Mackie as Falcon is such a cool character and I I, I want to see that guy already be Captain America. And I think that they're going to do that in the show. We'll just have to wait and see because they I can easily see that they prolong that and make it more like a drag it out of how he's going to become Captain America and I hope that they don't do that because I don't know. I I just feel like they I want it now. I just want to see him in the Captain America suit now. I think that that'll be so cool to see that. And hopefully that that's a good show too. Before I close the show. Before I close the show. I wanted to talk about the royal family a bit. I don't under I don't think that this is political. Could be. Um, I don't think that it is really because it's not really about American politics. It's more about. I guess it could be, but um, I I was just um. So I heard about the news about the interview with Oprah, Meghan Markle, and Prince Harry. By the way, what is Prince Harry's last name? I don't, I don't know what that is. Um, all I know is him as Prince Harry. Is Harry your last name? I, I don't know. Um, but um, the interview about them and being like in the royal family and being like, you know, being treated badly and asking their how their son's going to look and all that. Whew, a, a bit weird. A, a, a bit strange. I've never heard that question before. Um by the way, what kind of question is that? <laughs> that is so weird and um, kind of rude. Um, but it's like, actually, no, it is rude. It's like, why? Okay, it's your grandson. Does it matter? I mean, it was just weird. I've never heard anything like that before. And when I heard that, I was just like, wow, okay, cool. But um, when I hear about the royal family and I hear about you know, the family itself, right? We got the Queen, we got uh, Prince William, we got Prince Harry, uh, Kate Middleton, uh, Meghan Markle, uh, no longer in, along with Harry, and we got, uh, I don't know, I think the older boys, like Prince Andrew, I think, who was like, I don't know who that is. Um, and they're like, oh, this is, uh, they're very royal, you can't eat when the Queen's not eating and all that shit. I know nothing about the royal family at all. I know nothing about it, I, I never cared about it. And I still don't care at all. But I just want to know why so many Americans care about the royal family. I never understood why. Because I know that there's people that I know who do care about it. Because they lived in it with more like Princess Diana and all those people. Like That's all I know is Princess Diana from back in the day. And the Queen, obviously. But like I never really got the craze about it. I never knew why people cared why it would be a thing. I didn't even know that England said a monic, monic, uh, monic, uh, what, what's the word? Um, I'm blanking on the word. I, um, what's the word? Um, monarchy, monarchy. That's it. That's it. I didn't, I didn't know that they had a monarch monarchy still. And I was just like, what is this? Why do we care about this? This is, um, the United Kingdom. I don't care about this. What do they control things? I, I don't know. Do they declare war? I wasn't sure about that, and I was just like, why do, why do people care about this? And it's like, well, it's the royalty, it's the tr- tradition in Britain and all that, and the, the queen and the, the, the princes and the, who can marry who, and they have to do all this stuff, and they, they, they get fancy dresses and hats and all that, and then they have like a, um, what was she going to be, the princess of Sussex, I think? And it's like, who, what is Sussex? I don't know what Sussex is. I know England and London, Buckingham Palace and, and, and all that, but like, the hell is Sussex? I think that Sussex might have been like an old name for back in the day, a region of England or whatever. But I'm thinking like, why do we even care about this, man? Like, it just seems so weird to even care about it because I, it's not, again, it's like because it's not in America and I, I don't really think that a monarchy is, is uh, whether there are just celebrities or they actually have power, I'm not sure. 
But I, if they do have power, that's kind of weird because it's like you're a monarchy. Why are you doing it like that? Why why do you have a queen? Like it's it's I I didn't understand that. I never knew. Like maybe they don't have power. I'm not sure. But I was just thinking like, why do people care so much about these people in America? And I'm, and just like it, it puzzled me the entire week because again, why do we care? Why does everybody have to care about the royal family? Is it because the name, the royal family? Is it because of the queen still? Like, who even cares about the queen, really? I I don't get it. I don't understand why we have to care about that. Yes, they're they're one of our biggest allies. I get that, but like, I I don't. I, it it just it blew past me. I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure that family and that organization or the institution would have been poor and bad to live in. I mean, what do you what do you expect? It's a monarchy, right? Or it's 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 like all these strict rules of what you can wear, what you can't wear, where you can't go in this place, you can't go there, you can't eat at a certain time or whatever. It's like who would want that? Who would even think that that would be fun to live in? But I heard something about like in a section of the interview, like Meghan Markle didn't Google Prince Harry or whatever his name is. She didn't Google him or whatever. I heard like that one snippet. I'm like, I'm thinking like, Megan, that's a lie. That's got to be a lie. You had to have looked somebody up. I mean, it's it's not even like it's like it's almost basic um instinct to like when you meet somebody for the first time in 2020, 2021, whatever, that you look them up on something. That that just seemed like such a a a, a, a something that somebody wouldn't do. Like somebody would always look somebody up because hey, you have that ability to do it in your pocket on your phone. I, I, I heard that like little bit of a snippet of the interview. I just like, eh, she probably lied about that. But like other things like they were so mean to her. They did this. They did that. I'm like, why would, okay, why would they, first of all, did they not like you? I, I don't understand why they wouldn't like you. Um, But like, I was just thinking about like, wow, I don't blame her for leaving that shithole because it probably was trash. Um. I don't think that they're racist and all that. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't, but I, I would assume that they wouldn't be because they've been around for so long. And it's, it is 2021, but again, I'm thinking about like, okay, the queen is old as shit. I've heard Prince Andrew is old as shit. I mean, if, you, if you're just talking about older people, they have a... They could possibly be... Um, think that way I don't know maybe I don't know but I'm just saying but like that could potentially be a thing like you know well you should expect that they're racist people look at them they're old as shit they've been around for too long should have died a long time ago I think that if you know some people just live too long you know what I mean and they don't want to give up the times I'm not talking about racism or whatever but like I mean you see an old person right still using a phone book or still doing their taxes on paper, or still still doing their their um, things not online. It's like, what are you doing, bro? You know that there's such a, an easier way to do the tasks that you have to do, and then it's just like, well, maybe this person just lived way too long. Now I'm not saying that it's a bad way or anything like that, but I'm just saying like, you either adapt with the times, or you 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 you're just you're stuck, you know, right? You you do things differently, you you talk differently, you treat people differently, and they're all like, oh well, the world's adapting. What do I do? I don't want to. I don't want to adapt. I don't want to get. Um, I don't want to um evolve into a, a, a 2021 person. I want to stay the same as I did back in 1970 or 60, whatever. You know, but it's like it's not 1966 or 65 or whatever. It's 2021. Uh, do the things how we do them now, you, right? Like, wouldn't you want to do that? Like, and not be like a so just out of the loop on everything. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so maybe like maybe like the Prince Andrew and the Queen are just like you guys are fucking old. Like, I I I don't, I don't know how like old the Queen is. I'll look it up right now. You know, just for. The fun of it, I don't know how old she is, but uh, let's see. How old is the Queen of England? 101. Are you kidding? Really? Wait a minute. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Nope, that's not it. That's the wrong one. Wrong Queen. Elizabeth II, I think. Let's see. Elizabeth II. Yep, that's her. That's definitely her. Age. 94. 
born in April 21st, 1926. Jesus Christ. Okay, so she's still really, really old. I mean, I guess she was born in the 20s, so. It's funny because... <clears throat> I don't think that a lot of people really uh, think that that it was a big deal for Megan. I mean, I just heard about it, so like, I think a lot of people are like, Complaining like, oh, well, you should um, get used to it because that's what you're doing or that's what you signed up for or that's what you wanted to do. Or you, if you love Harry, then do it. Just do it. Just just get used to it. But it's like, yeah, but I'm not stupid. This is dumb. Like, I love Harry and I married Harry. And maybe Harry doesn't want to be a part of it either. I think he doesn't. So, like, he's gone. Everybody's like, well, they, they, we don't like them anymore because they, they abandoned the royal family and now they don't want to do the things that we've been doing for years and years and years and we're a monarchy and all that. And it's like, well, I wouldn't blame him. I mean, now you can wear whatever you want, do whatever you want, um, say whatever you want, really. Go places you couldn't go before without like security or guards or whatever. So it's like, in the end, Megan is winning, bro. She's now free. And I believe that because, you know, just going back to like why, what thing, what the things that they couldn't do, like eat, drink without the queen eating or drinking. What the fuck is that? It's so stupid. It makes no sense. Like, I wouldn't want to live in a house, in a family where I could only eat when my mother was eating or my father was eating. That would be such a stupid thing. Like, that. that's just like, that's not even like setting rules to better society. That's just setting rules to follow some person and just showing that you have all the power and you do whatever you want. And you listen to me when I say this, that's like, it's, it's not even like making it better for people. It's just saying like, I have the power and I do this. And you, when you do this, when I do this, because I have the power and I believe that since I'm the queen or the king, I can, uh, you do what I say. And it's just like, no, that's stupid. We don't have kings and queens anymore. Maybe some countries do, but like, we've kind of moved on from kings and queens into democracies and republics and all that. So I don't know why they still do that. And I don't know why Americans care about that. It's just so weird. It's so like, it's almost anti-American, right? I mean, you do this when I do this, when I do this, you do that. And you never do this and you never go there because if I wouldn't go there and I'm, I would never go in this area during this time of the day. And I go to bed at this time. And since I go to bed, then you go to bed when I eat, you eat, when I drink, you drink. No, that's, that's really dumb. And I, I, I don't blame Harry and Megan for leaving. I would have left too. If I was the King, I would say, you can do whatever the fuck you want, bro. I just want to be liked. I understand that I have power, but I want to use that power to make you happy. And if I can make you happy with the power that I have, then I've completed my mission. I've done what I needed needed to do. And I made people happy. I'm not saying I want to be king or anything like that. I, I don't think anybody, single person who's in power, it's inevitable that you would get drunk with your power. So it's it's just like a, it's, it's, it's you, you take it all the way back to like the, um, let's take it back to the cavemen people, right? The head of the house, the head of the hut, the head of the cave, whatever, had all the power. And how do you think that those people um, died out or whatever? Maybe the, the guy was corrupt with power and he just did stupid decisions and he did like dumb choices and he did dumb things. And then everybody abandoned him or they rose up against him and all that. And it's just like no person who has in, in, in a position of power is going to be able to make um, everybody happy or... Um, everybody, um, no person of power is going to be like, hey, I have all the power. I will make them do this. Like, I feel like that's almost like inevitable when you give people power. And when you have that power, like, like, like for instance, the queen is like, oh, it's just about we, what we've been doing for centuries and centuries and centuries. It's like, well, yeah, you have, but now in 2021, it's just like, well, okay. So I, I like what Meghan and Harry did. Fuck the royals. Never cared about them. Never will. So whenever I hear royal shit, I'm like, who cares? H who cares? 
Some people do. Okay. You can care. But I won't care. Sorry, not sorry. Not going to apologize about it. Anyways, that's going to do it for my episode today. This episode, episode 6. Already episode 6. Approaching 10. Very soon. Um, I just want to say, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Um, again, I will say where you can find me on. Um, Apple Podcast, Spotify. YouTube at Intelligent Moron with Alex Silva. And don't forget, on Apple Podcasts, you can scroll down all the way to the bottom on your phone or tablet. And there's an option to rate a review. Click that five-star review and leave a review. I want to hear what you uh, what you think. I want some feedback. I want some um, suggestions of what I should do, what, should, what I should talk about, what you would like to hear, see, whatever. Um, yeah, I want to know what's happening. I want to know what's, uh, what's going down. I want to know what you think. And remember, you can find me on all those platforms, watch it on YouTube if you want to watch on YouTube. If you don't really use a podcast feed, you just have YouTube open. I appreciate that. I appreciate you guys listening and subscribing and liking and reviewing and rating. Thank you all so much, and I will see you guys next week. <laughs>